I, I want to say it's nice to come into the warm, but I'm from Melbourne. <laughs> it's nice to come into the cool. So I was walking down uh, Singapore, streets of Singapore today in the absolute sweltering heat, and I love the fact that some stores have their doors open and let all the air con out. I hate the fact from an environmental perspective, but it, you just slow down a bit, don't you? Just walk on a little bit. So I want to talk to you tonight about, um, it's an introductory talk about identity. So what is OpenID Connect, OAuth 2, uh, and, and things of that sort. I tend to walk around a lot, which has two implications. One, the person on the camera has to keep moving the camera, and two, I keep standing in front of the presentation that you're looking at. So I'll try not to do that too much. Um, if I'm getting in the way of something, just stick your hand up and tell me to move. I can speak a bit louder. Do we have speakers? No? Well, yeah, but I was just wondering whether the speakers work. Do the speakers work? Yeah, he just asked me. Like, I have no idea because I don't know what you're Oh, there's a little mixer here. What does that do? We have power now. Oh, oh, you can hear me. Hooray. That's so much better. So I'll go from the beginning. Not all of it. So my name is Ben Deckeray. I'm a developer evangelist for uh, Auth0. Developer, developer evangelist basically means that I evangelize developers back to the company. So I go out and I talk to people, um, sometimes on the street when there's no venue, um, but usually in offices like this, uh, about anything from security, identity, privacy, those type of topics. And I love to find out how people are facing the challenges in their products and in their software development so that I can learn more about what people need. And if Auth0 can't solve that problem, um, then either get or zero to be able to solve that problem, or maybe have a chat and see if there's any other ways you can address those issues. Um, but tonight, I want to talk to you about identity, um, not so much the security and anonymity side of things, uh, and beyond. So an intro introductory talk, like I said. Clicker doesn't want to work. Oh, use my keyboard. So, where did identity start? It's a bit of a history, I'll, I'll sit down. How's that? Then the camera doesn't have to move around. <laughs> and I'm not in the point of the heads down in the front here. All right, so where did identity start? Um, I'm sure you probably all remember this screen. Maybe not this exact screen, but who saw this? Maybe about 10, 15 years ago when you signed up for a new service and they said, hey, we can probably find all of your friends and really easily connect you on this social media platform of choice. Just give us your email address and your email password and we'll log into your email account for you. And we'll go through all of your contacts and we'll find out to see if any of those email addresses exist in our system. And if they do, we'll automatically invite them to connect with you on our system. And everyone thought, that is so convenient. So every everybody typed in their email address and their email password. How many people typed their email password in? <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to see there are no hands up. So how did this work? Somebody would come along to, so there's your uh, social media provider on the right there. Somebody comes in uh, and logs in and passes their credentials across. They then pass those details directly to Yahoo Mail, Gmail, whoever the email provider is, and they pass the credentials, your username, password, straight in, which then means that they can return the address list, or worse still, maybe just scour every single email to see whose email do you, to see if those email addresses exist in the system as well. Pull all the email addresses out, and then do some kind of comparison with all the users in the local database, and do some kind of match up there. So obviously the, the thing that we don't want at this point, the really worrisome part, is that your credentials are on a server that should never know them. You, we, we hear every day, don't share your passwords with anybody. Banks are telling us not to ever tell them what our um, security pins are if we've got a, an external device. We're very aware nowadays that sharing passwords is a bad idea. So whoever thought that asking for it in the first place, especially a big social media platform like Facebook did it, LinkedIn did it. Um, I don't know if Twitter ever did it, but the big platforms were doing this. Convenience, convenience always wins out. And that's something that we as developers need to remember when our customers, our clients are using our applications that they will do whatever's most convenient. And if writing the password down on a post-it note and sticking it on the monitor is the most convenient thing to do, they will do that. The advantage is they'll only need to write one password down on that, that post-it note. 
because they use it on every site. So what's the better way of doing it? OAuth came along, so we thought we need a way of allowing systems to talk to other systems on behalf of somebody else. Can we give a third-party system authorization to do something uh, in our name? So how does this work? How does OAuth fix the friend finder issue? So you head off to the social media site and you log in and you want to get some kind of information out of your email account. So the um, the social media site will send back a request to you, or rather your browser in this case, which is actually a redirect, which takes you off to the email provider. The email provider then asks you to log in, and you provide your credentials only to the email provider. Email provider then logs you in, creates some kind of token, which returns back to your browser, and your browser can then send that token back to the social media provider. Social media provider can then take that token and make a request passing that token down into the email provider for the contacts and get the contacts in return, which you can then do the database stuff with. So the magical part here is that you'll see that on that side there, on the untrusted, well, actually, there's possibly more trusted, like the server side, the, the, um, the services that we as users, as web browser users, don't see. We never pass our credentials over there except to the endpoint that needs it. The email service that you use is obviously allowed to know your email credentials because that's how you log in. But at all the times you've got this token, and this token has uh, a, an expiry. It has certain credentials around it that means that it's harder to be reused by other people. And because it's only ever passed server to server here, with the exception of via your browser, it's very hard for a third party to get access to that token. I say very hard. It's not impossible. But it's beyond the scope of this. There are ways around that as well. Now, the interesting thing with this is that OAuth is for uh, authorization, not authentication. So what does OAuth allow us to do? It allows us to do things like saying LinkedIn can read emails on Gmail. So we've got our two services either side and we've got an authorization in the middle. I am allowing LinkedIn to look at my Gmail account. So I am allowing TweetDeck to post tweets on my Twitter feed. Or I'm allowing Eventbrite to create events on my Facebook page. Can I get Eventbrite to get my identity from Twitter? OAuth wasn't designed for that. But it's a huge big hole, and one of the, the providers, Twitter and, and Google in particular, and Facebook as well, were looking at ways like, how can we actually get identity information from somebody else? We want to be able to create an account really easily in our system without the user having to create yet another whole, another whole profile. Can we pre-seed that information? Again, make it more convenient for the user to sign up. The more convenient it is, the more likely they're going to complete the sign-up process, the more likely they're going to be an account, the more likely that they're going to bring their friends on, the more likely we'll make money out of them. It's always about money. How can we make more money? We need an identity. So this user info endpoint was created. Uh, so OAuth, or OAuth 2 more specifically, was like the, the base platform that started this whole conversation between multiple services. Uh, and then these different providers added another layer on top, which is like this. <coughs> generic user info endpoint, which allowed them to get more information out, again, using that token mechanism. So if we look at what we had before, ignore the bit at the bottom that's supposed to be hidden at the moment. <laughs> but before we had this request to, uh, for example, get contacts, and you, you have this token and you pass it in in the header as a, a bearer token, and the response will come back in some kind of, I don't know, XML format or, or whatever with a list of all the contacts. And there are standards for contacts. We've got vcal and vcard for calendars and cards. So you can, there's, there's, there's ways of making sure that there's some kind of interoperability. And what they did was they added this other one on called user info. So there was this user info endpoint that could be at slash user info, or um, uh, there was a, another standard, because standard, there's two now. Um, there are actually a whole lot of different URLs for the user info, info endpoint, and we, we don't necessarily know exactly what that is for any one given provider. And also the response we get back, there, there was no standard for that. You might get an XML document or a JSON document or maybe even a plain text carriage return, uh, a SAML, or not SAML, actually it could be a SAML response as well, um, which can carry some identity information. Or it could just be like a, a name equals Ben carriage return plain text file or CSV. There was, so you had to know who you were talking to in order to know how to decode the information to come out. And it was all very messy. But if you knew exactly who you were talking to, then you could sort it out. But it was still early days. This is where OpenID Connect came in. So this is basically the standardization of that user info endpoint. 
I, um, I found a really nice definition of what OpenID Connect is. And when I paste it into the screen, I hate putting lots of text on the screen because then I've got to read it out and you're all reading along with me and it never works out well because you can't concentrate on what you're reading because I'm talking and I'm talking, therefore you're not reading either properly. So I, I took this and I broke it down into the key line. So OpenID Connect is essentially a simple identity layer which sits on top of OAuth 2. <coughs> it's designed to verify identity, obtain basic profile information in an interoperable and REST-based, uh, REST-like manner, and then using JSON as a data format for the response. So there's still a lot of variables in here, like what does the JSON format look like? Um, what, how, how's the get request made? What's the versioning for the URLs? Is it a post or a get or a... But you've already got these uh, six main attributes that if you meet these, then it's OpenID Connect which made it much easier for us to interoperate. So if you had got another party that you wanted to have as an identity provider of sorts, it was much easier to modify your application to use that. And in fact, a lot of libraries would then start taking account of that for you. So that's where we got to. That's the, the kind of the history up to where we got to with OpenID Connect. Um, but one thing I'd like to have a quick look at here now is the bit about uh, JSON as a data format. So JSON itself, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, um, is like a key value hierarchical data storage of sorts. Um, but in order to provide identity in some kind of secured fashion, like you get this JSON format of an identity, how do you know that it hasn't been modified at any point? Because remember that it goes back to the browser and then the browser sends it off to a third party. So JSON web tokens are a way of using JSON to provide information in a manner that can be readily verified as being untampered with. Has anybody here familiar with JSON web tokens already. Does anybody actually use them? Does anybody understand how they work? Interestingly, one hand went up for the third question. They usually get smaller, but... <laughs> okay, so this is a JSON web token. You're welcome. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs> um, most people look at this and go, oh yeah, cool, um, if they've already used it before, and other people just go, what on earth? That's not JSON. Um, but if you, I'll just do a little bit of highlighting, which I'm not sure you can actually see on there. Um, but I've made the dots yellow, and you can see there's three components, and each one of those components is base64 URL encoded, which if you decode, makes them look a little bit like this, with the exception of the third part. So you have a header, you've got a payload, and you've got a signature. And the signature, according to the header, is a HMAC256 um, hash of the header and the payload. You can also use... Uh, RSA-256 encoding or hashing. Um, the difference of those being HMAC will be like a shared key, so every system that needs to verify or create JSON web tokens will have the same password, uh, whereas um, RSA is a public-private key. So if you're communicating with systems that are out of your control, you don't necessarily um, trust them entirely, you'll probably want to go for the RSA. Uh, in a lot of cases, you can probably argue that RSA is a better option um, but HMAC can be useful depending on your particular setup. And then in this case, we're looking at an identity token. So you can see there the subject, um, SUB. So there are a couple of keys in a JSON web token on an identity token uh, that are kind of pre-reserved. There's no enforcement about what goes into a JSON web token, but there are some that you should use for only one purpose and you shouldn't clobber with other information. So SUB is one of those, that's the subject. And in terms of an identity token, this is the response that you get back to, a, to uniquely identify a user that's logged in. So every time I log in, no matter whether I've changed my name or my email address or my password or anything else, every time I log in to an identity provider and I get an identity token back, that subject should always be the same. Uh, in this case, I've got name, job title, and region, which are user characteristics, you can, uh, user attributes. You can make anything up you want that goes into JSON. Uh, just try that there's, um, if you search uh, using your favorite online search engine. I'm not going to promote anyone in particular, but DuckDuckGo is pretty good from a privacy perspective. Uh, if you search for um, like the, the keys that are semi-reserved in JSON uh, web tokens, you'll, you'll get a list of those. And then IAT or issued at is another one. You've also got EXP for expired um, and a few others. So that's basically a, um, like an epoch seconds since some date in 1970s. So you've got your identity token, and then you also have uh, a 
an access token. So in this case, it's less about the identity. We do have a little bit of identity in there. We know the subject. This is the person who's actually logging in or the person who wants access to a third party, like an API, for example. Uh, we'll also have the issuer, so we know exactly who issued the certificate, which allows the, the lying party or the client that's consuming this access token to know, well, it was issued by this provider, and I know that I trust that provider. It also has an audience. AUD is another reserved one. So audience is who's allowed to look at this token, which is an interesting one because JSON Web Tokens, by design, are plain text. Anybody can look at it. You could send it to any endpoint you want, and the endpoint can use it if it wants to. But if you're writing an endpoint, like an API, that's accepting an access token, then you'll want to make sure that access token was destined for you. If, you're, if you don't care, then you're probably not the, the endpoint that it was destined for. But you can still use that information, that's fine. The interesting thing at that point is that if, you're, if, you, if it's not destined for you, if you write an endpoint and you accept a JSON web token from anyone, then you don't know what key was used, what pre-shared key uh, was used in the hashing algorithm. Therefore, you can't verify the signature. So the information might actually be invalid. And if we just jump back a couple of slides. So this bit at the end here, the bit that starts, uh, where's my mask on? Over here. Uh, after this dot here, starting with a capital A and ending in the four on the next line. So this here is essentially, you take the, the header and the payload and you put it through the HMAC256 hashing algorithm using a, uh, a shared key and then you base 64 year old encode that result and that's what goes in there. So now this means that you can send it to any other endpoint, any other consumer of a JSON web token and as long as they know what that password is, they can take the header and the payload they can generate their own signature based on those and the key they already know, and then match it to this signature. And if they match, then you know that the data hasn't been modified. Otherwise, I could go into this one here and I could change my job title to CEO. And maybe that would mean I get a pay rise. I'm not sure. So where to beyond this? Um, I thought the best thing here is just to throw a lot of information in your face and talk about how this all kind of comes together. And this is the, the last slide, um, but I'd love to continue the conversation and see where you're using it and where you're going from here and what kind of questions you have around identity. But if we look at the setup here, we've got the identity provider in the middle there. That's this one here. So you've got your identity provider, and you've got all these tokens floating around within your service-oriented uh, uh, service oriented environment or um, between multiple different third parties, however you want to architect your system. Um, you've got, my mouse keeps disappearing, you've got an API down here that you've written, which is accessible from your web applications and also your mobile applications to the cloud, and you've got your tokens being passed around here. And the key thing here to notice is if you see those two orange lines, those lines that just went orange, those are the only two authentication routes. So that's the credentials being passed from the web application or from the, the mobile application directly into the identity provider. The identity provider is the only system that ever gets your user's credentials. And from there, tokens manage the authorization, uh, identity, and um, so the authentication, identity, and also the authorization components of what that token allows each system to do on behalf of that user. The other thing you'll notice on the right-hand side is we've even got Active Directory. I don't know if that's an official Active Directory logo, but we use that for federation. So you can federate out to other systems. You can link that back into the identity provider. Um, you could add in things like multi-factor authentication at this point here because it's all controlled in one spot. Whether or not you're using something like Auth0 or you roll your own or you get Key Cloak and run that in your own environment or you go to uh, another identity as a service pro provider, there'll be a certain number of features that you can use at that point to enhance security even more without having to modify all of your applications because all your applications really care about now is, is the t do I have a token, is it valid? And then it can go from there. So I was planning on bringing up the Auth0 dashboard just to go through some of the kind of options that you can have uh, applicable to other providers as well, which I'll be happy to do. But if anybody, if anybody has any questions about what I've gone through already, um, I'm more than happy to take them. Just let me bring up a whole different slideshow. <coughs> Why you shouldn't care about security. You're getting a double whammy tonight. Let's have two presentations. Why not? 
uh, why shouldn't you care about security? So I'll give you the, the short version of why you shouldn't care about security, because that's all zero's job. You shouldn't have to care. So there's the tagline. But here is how Let me see if I can find the right slide. Is it even this slideshow? Maybe it's a different one. It's a good question. I don't think it's actually this slideshow. All right, what I'll do instead, um, because this is the way I like to do things, is I will stand in front of you and I'll gesticulate and I'll move around because that's a great way of helping people understand how things work. All right, so you have your browser, you've got the big cloud here that you connect through, and over here you've got the website that you're trying to log into. And right over there is when I get too close to the speaker and I get really bad feedback. So I'll stand back a little further and then walk into a table. So uh, when somebody logs into your website, so imagine this is your website that you're logging into and there's an the table is the identity provider. So somebody sends a request to you. Um, you already have a relationship with the identity provider set up. So in most cases, that'll be two things. If it's uh, uh, HS256, um, it, so it's talking specifically about JSON web token type token stuff. If it's HS256, we both know the same password. I also have a client ID, which is generated by the identity provider. Uh, and I know the URL of the identity provider. So what happens is I have a client ID, and that's public information to all intents and purposes. So you've just made a request to log in. So I then take that client ID and I send it back to you, to your browser. Your browser is then told to redirect down here with that client ID. So it sends a request to the identity provider with the client ID, so the identity provider now knows which login form to present, because it's the one that looks like your website, because you've customized it to look like it. It also knows which database to look up users in, because it's, it's linked to that client ID. So it pre presents you with a login form. You then log into that server down there. It then returns to you an auth code. So the auth code is somewhat like an opaque token. It's basically a string. It's most, well, it's totally random. Um, it gets sent back to your browser, but that auth code by itself is useless. That auth code is then redirected by your browser back to your website. So your website then has the auth code, and it's also got the pre-shared key with the identity provider, and it knows the URL of the identity provider, so it makes a request to the identity provider saying, for this client ID, with this pre-shared key, and this auth code that I just got from a browser, is that a valid login? So the identity provider at this point has remembered that it just sent you that auth code, which is ABC, for example, and goes, well, okay, I can link that up. So John has just logged in. I'm gonna create a JSON web token for an identity and possibly also an access token. I'm gonna to send them to you in a back channel. So we've now got over TLS, HTTP, a point-to-point, -point, server server-to-server request, um, which is sent via post, so it's not a callback. So you've got all sorts of things in there that make it a lot less likely for somebody to be able to intervene and get those tokens. The tokens are then stored uh, in memory. Um, you can persist them if you want, certain security implications around that, but it persists in memory on the server. The uh, client, meanwhile, your browser, already has a session, a cookie session, established. So now every request that comes in, I get the session, I reinstantiate the session locally, I've got your tokens, therefore I can now talk off to Twitter or whichever other APIs use these tokens. So the auth code is used, long story short, to basically send a, it's almost like a one-time password to allow the server to ask the identity provider for the tokens. Does that make sense? Then how do you expire those uh, tokens with the website? Two ways you can do that. The first one is you can put a really short expiry on them. So I would generally have an expiry of, I don't know, five minutes, depending on my use case. In some cases, I would advocate a, an expiry of 20 seconds, depending on whether I just need to make one call to this really high risk service. And if anybody else managed to do it, then I don't know, I could kill somebody. Or maybe it's a really low risk one, and I'm happy for that session, for that token to last a day. In any event, you can also make uh, a token, uh, a refresh token. So the identity provider, if you, if you, so there's scopes, and the scope you'd have like profile, for example, is a standard scope for give me profile information about the user. And then you've got uh, OpenID as another scope, which is what then generates the JSON web tokens and the, the access token. You can also have an offline scope. 
And if you define offline as a scope, then you get returned a refresh token, which means that the because the server can now use your token even when you're not logged in to talk to another system, if that token expires, it can take the refresh token, which is a <coughs> lot longer expiry. It could be like 30 days or six months or whatever. They can take that token. It can talk directly to the identity provider and only to the identity provider, pass it the refresh token and say, the last token I was using has expired. Give me another one. And then it'll return both a new access token and a new refresh token so that that can continue happening in the background. So I would advocate having, working out what your risk profile is for if the token gets breached, what's going to, um, what's going to happen? Like what's the worst that could happen? And define your expiry so you're comfortable with that. If you're in a situation where you want the token to last a day just because of the environment you're running it in and the way your users interact with your application, but you need to be able to cancel the token uh, a lot faster, then you can implement your own um, blacklisting, token blacklisting. So for example, if you had a token that allowed people to log into your corporate email, but then you fire somebody at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and you need to, to cancel that token immediately, you would add that token into a blacklist, and then you would have some kind of mechanism, whether it's a centralized gateway or the application itself, to say, OK, well, this token is no longer valid. We'll kick them out. Can you tell me the difference between off zero and uh, off, off two? No. So auth, auth zero is the company. Oh. And then you've got OAuth and OAuth two. So OAuth and OAuth two are the protocols. Yes. The, so one and two. Correct. So they move from one to two, and so it's, it's stuck on two. And OAuth 2 is the one we use nowadays. OAuth 1 is actually slightly different. It's not really like version 2 of OAuth 1. Okay. It's actually it's quite different, but we don't so use OAuth 1 anymore. The architecture is totally different. Yeah. Okay. And nobody has used OAuth 1 anymore. Is it, is it, is it abandoned? Um, is it? Yeah, it's not really in use. It's, it's not actually, it doesn't solve the same problem as OAuth 2 does. Okay. Um, OAuth 2 was more around. Uh, OAuth 1 was essentially like the. Um, the great idea that people had that they tried to implement and it had a lot of security vulnerabilities, but people used it. And it was a great way to get us to think about how to do uh, authentication in that way, in a better way. And then OAuth 2 was a re-implementation that actually worked. Okay. And that's the one we use. And Auth0 is the company. Auth0 is the company, yeah. And what about OpenID? OpenID and OpenID Connect? Yes. So OpenID is, a, again, an older technology. It's a, and also very little to do with OpenID Connect. OpenID, if anybody remembers like 10 years ago or so, um, we were talking about this before, the, it was very popular for people to install um, like plugins on their websites that would provide OpenID um, capabilities. And essentially what it was is that you'd have a line in your, um, like the header of your HTML document. Um, so my OpenID handle would be https colon slash slash bendecry.com. And then if I wanted to log in somewhere, that system would load that web page, look for the, the meta tag in the document, which would define who my OpenID provider was, which could also be WordPress in, in this instance. It would then redirect me to that endpoint, which I would then log into, and then it would send back uh, the identification or the authorization in, in the response redirect. So. It was, yeah. Whereas OpenID Connect is the standardization and proper implementation of the user info endpoint, plus a few other things, hey? On, on top of OAuth2, yeah. So OpenID Connect only exists in conjunction as stacked on top of OAuth2. Without OAuth2 underneath it, it doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, what is the difference between OAuth2 and OAuth2? Uh, how do you end up storing the uh, security keys? Uh, I have my OAuth set up and then we go through my JWG and you know my auth servers does the verification. But for, for doing all of that, I need to have the signature, the, the security key to verify the signature. Yep. So, and every company, or rather even in a company, every project sort of starts having its own solution to starting doing this. Same products in the different companies. Right? So what would you say would be the most safest and like the simplest way to be able so just to clarify, you're talking about where to store the pre-shared key in an HMAC yep. hashing yep. algorithm. Um, so by and large, if you have any questions about whether or not it's secure, you probably should be looking at RSA hashing and using public-private key. Can you give me an example of why it wouldn't be secure in your particular case? Uh, 
Uh, no, it might be secure, but for example, even if that key, say, sometimes in some projects you might see the key lying around in a properties file or in a sure. JSON file somewhere. Yeah. So even if it's safe from everyone else, it's not safe from the developer. Well, so thinking about a, a Laravel application, for example, um, I come from a PHP <coughs> background and I was recently integrating Laravel with Auth0. So I would have it in my .env file, which means that that those are variables that are instantiated only when the server starts, and they're in environment um, variables, so they're in memory only. They're persisted to disk because they're in that file, but that file never gets pushed into a Git repository, therefore it should never end up on GitHub or Bitbucket or anything like that. Uh, from a developer perspective, as a developer, I wouldn't be using production keys anyway. I would have a key that is for me to use in a sandbox or a, a staging or a development environment. The only person that should have access to the, the whether or not you're doing it through a .env file or you're injecting it through Apache configuration or whatever mechanism you're using to uh, manifest this key in, in memory so that the application can use it, the only person that should have access to that file is the person who's got ac access to the production server. And if you don't trust them to have access to the production server, then you've got bigger problems. <laughs> Uh, and uh, pending on this, so uh, like I work for e-commerce form. So right. what we do is we integrate with a lot of social media because when someone makes a purchase, for example, we'd also want them to flaunt the same thing on social media. Right? Sure. So we have all of the tokens from the different social media websites. And uh, <coughs> as you, because of the nature of tokens, we assume uh, that uh, these are safe things to store in plain text. So we put them on a database or somewhere on Redis or some cache or something like that. Yeah. So do you think that's safe? I just want to evaluate whether this premise is safe, because that's what we're doing right now. So I have two conflicting answers for that. The first is that I think everybody should treat every token as breached. So if you have an, an access token or a, um, <coughs> an, well, particularly identity tokens. Access tokens, you want to be even yeah, more so these would particular be about. Primarily around posting permissions or? Yeah, so you're looking at an access token to talk to another, yeah. another system. Um, so, in, in that case, I think you should treat the payload as breached, but not the signature. Um, and even then, because the signature is based on a pre-shared key, it's not terrible for that to be breached. Now, of course, the hard part is that once anybody has that, they can use it against any system, so that's something you don't want to have. But if you have the mentality that it's breached at all times, then that puts you in a defensive position. So you're more likely to consider the negative outcomes of that. Now, the flip side to the answer of that is that, um, I forgot what the flip side to the answer of that was. You look like you want to say something too? Yeah, maybe, I, um, maybe just to add uh, on top of what Ben mentioned. So I think just to also uh, uh, make a subtle distinction between tokens and keys. So keys um, are used to generate tokens. Or Keys in terms of storage, depending on the type of application that you have, if it's production, definitely you should not store them on this. They have to be stored either in a HSM, not sure if you guys are familiar with that term, that's a hardware security model, yeah. where it's uh, uh, like a black box or a coffin that uh, nobody can actually tamper or access that. But that's more of a specialized device, uh, most bands are probably going to use that, but really depends on maybe if you're doing e-commerce, you might not have access to that. So an alternative is to look at, I guess, you know, cloud providers that kind of like offer similar thing. So I would rather use maybe um, um, an Amazon Vault or um, uh, online teaser cloud to store that. Uh, but you also have a predicament if you go with that approach, because then the question is, you're basically subjecting your key to be stored on a different computer. But that's a little bit different conversation altogether. So just to keep the focus on what you have in terms of uh, storing the keys, if you want it to be really secure, uh, never store it on this for production. As I guess Ben rightfully said, maybe for development, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but definitely production has to be stored on a much more secure uh, storage facility. Um, on the point of tokens. Um, just one, one second. Um, I'm presuming they're going to be post-editing this, so I'm going to quickly summarize what you said just for the recording. Um, so basically it was making a distinction, and correct me if I'm wrong or if I missed something, it was making a distinction between keys and tokens, um, and specifically when we're looking at keys in a production environment, never to store them on disk. 
the best way of doing that would be to use something like a uh, hardware security module. It comes at a cost, um, but it's a great way of storing that information in one place that the application can then get access to in a secure fashion. That means that if the actual system is breached, uh, somebody SSHs into your server, they're not going to be able to get access to that, those keys. I guess on, on the second point, I think very quickly. So um, when we talk about this, there's a reason why there is uh, uh, issuance time and expiration time. Because um, again, a token should be just you know uh, one time thing. That's why it's kind of like a token. You know, um, there, there is a um, I guess uh, a validity when you can use that. Um, again, depending on what kind of application you have, as Ben uh, like really mentioned, depending on the risk that you're trying to to manage. Um, it is really a matter of uh, managing the timings, but never have a token that has an indefinite time. Because the moment that you do that, well, in fact, there is a token that's called a password that has an indefinite time. Well, you might have you know, a policy or um, kind of like a HR policy to kind of like say that you have to change your password every three months and whatnot, but um, it, it's still, um, I think, uh, based on the fact that you should always have a uh, short time to uh, issue those tokens, so they get a bit <coughs> So just to repeat that for the recording, um, look, when looking at tokens, the main things to consider are again the issue time and the expiry and making sure that the window of validity is short enough that it meets all of your security risk analysis while being long enough to actually be usable in the context that you're using it. And generally, you don't uh, persist access tokens anyway. It's just, uh, that's right. So you, you wouldn't persist access tokens, you'd store them in memory. If you're, if you're storing everything on your server, um, then your risk is a lot lower than if you've got a single page app. In a single page app, you would certainly only ever store any kind of token in memory, so that if somebody refreshes the page or there's a cross-site scripting attack, it's really hard to get that token out. Uh, there used to be a recommendation that within a single page app, you store the access token in local storage, which is now highly discouraged, um, basically because if, uh, and we, we don't know what browser uh, add-ons people are running either. If somebody's got Grease Monkey running and somebody's managed to inject a script that then scours your, uh, your local storage and sends it all off via an XML HTTP, uh, XHR, HTTP XML request off to a third-party server, then you hold, they can dump your memory and just shove it all off to another system. Um, so. I mean, there's an issue there that they could dump the memory and, and look at it, but it's harder to analyze than if it's stored in a cookie. Some people actually stored them in cookies. That scared me that I heard that. Um, so definitely not cookies, and uh, uh, ideally uh, not in uh, local storage either. And of course, if you're, if you're establishing a session with a, a server in any way, make sure your cookies are HTTP only because if somebody does manage to get an XML uh, cross-site scripting attack on your single page application, they can run arbitrary JavaScript in your application. So if the cookie, if the browser won't give the cookie to, um, to JavaScript, then you're more secure in that respect as well. Any other questions? Yes. If you're implementing what, sorry, Tomcat? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, I'm afraid. No. Um, maybe, maybe we can go into it afterwards. I'll be happy to find out more about what you're doing, how you're using it. We can work that out. So that sounds more like an access control list mechanism as opposed to an authentication system itself. So it's all about, in, in this particular case, it's about where you're storing the identities of your users, how you're authenticating them, what kind of mechanisms you're using to store those credentials, what multi-factor authentication mechanisms you're using on top of that, whether you're connecting to 
um, an Active Directory server to feed that information. So the identity, what all zero provides is more around the, the whole identity platform picture of how to work out who's using the system. You can do access control in there as well, but it sounds like what the Tomcat thing does is more around knowing who the user is and then doing access control to certain yeah, areas. So do you think this is enough? That it sounds like they're different things. So you would pro potentially use something like Auth0 in order to authenticate <coughs> and provide information back to the Tomcat server so that you're not storing your usernames and passwords in, in your database. You're having them managed elsewhere. But that token then allows you to, to identify who the user is and then go on to work out which yeah. web pages they're allowed yeah. to access. Yeah. yeah. So that if I have something like that, I don't, think I don't need this uh, off. No, I think... I think they're different things. So to to use an example, imagine you're going to a bar and you want to buy a drink. So it sounds like what the Tomcat stuff is doing is working out which drinks you're allowed to buy. Are you allowed to buy gin and tonic or only Coke? That depends on who you are, how old are you, what are your credentials. So one way they could do it is you go to the banter or the front door and you tell them your name and address and your parents' phone number and they can then call to make sure you're the right age and all these other things. That's kind of like managing your own authentication. Um, or you can have a driver's license and you show them the driver's license, which has all this information printed on it, but it also looks like a Singaporean driver's license and has got the holographic symbol on it, and that's like the token. So Auth0 is like the driver's, the, the driving authority, the licensing authority. Isn't it the same? Isn't it the same? No, because what Auth0, I mean, Auth0 can do the authorization stuff as well, but what it's doing in, what, what the Tomcat stuff that you're talking about is doing is the uh, authorization after you know the identity. So you can either manage all the identity yourself, and to be honest, one of the biggest competitors that Auth0 has is Roll Your Own. So you can, you can use the login mechanism that you already have within Tomcat and the system that you're using, or you can use Auth0 to provide that, and you would still then use your Realm data to work out what they can access. But the login is separate. The advantage of separating that out into an identity provider is that you've then got the ability to reuse that within other systems that you also have to log in and out of. And you can add things like multi-factor authentication, social login, out of the box. So the OOP will be one more layer to identify this person is really the person. Is, is the person? Are we talking about OAuth or Auth0? Because you asked about Auth0 at the beginning and then you reference OAuth now. OAuth itself is... Auth itself is almost like the Realm type thing, but it's a, a trustless environment. So there's two services that trust each other because of OAuth, but service A doesn't need to trust service B. Whereas in the Tomcat Realm environment, I imagine you probably need to trust all of the backend systems to have this shared access control. I'm, I'm, Tr I'm guessing a lot of this because I don't actually understand the technology and maybe I'm not the right person to answer these questions for you. One of the things, the authentication and authorization is separate. <coughs> Did you have another question? Uh, it would be slightly off topic, but since you're here. Uh, could, you, <laughs> could you talk a bit about uh, the SOC2 compliance and uh, just like... Uh, uh, maybe like a small primer because we have to direct ourselves to that way, but we don't know where to start. So. I'm the wrong person to ask that. Okay. Yeah. SOC2 is just a certification. Yes. Yeah. I mean, by the time. No, I have the, the better question is uh, how does how does uh, someone fail an SOC2 compliance certification? What, what, what goes wrong? Why would you not get certified? It's the more important. Yeah, that's beyond me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Let's say that you have an application and you have a business partner who is operating an identity supplier. What is the burden for them to implement Java Web Token? Uh, sorry, the, the JSON Web Token. JSON Web Token. So they're an IDP already, and they don't currently use JSON Web Tokens. Yeah. So what is the ask? You're asking them to do a lot. I don't know what they currently do. 
Um, if, if they currently provide an opaque token for uh, access control, then, I don't know, it's, an, it's a black box, black box question. I don't know what their data structure is like, what their framework they're using. I mean, technically, you could well, argue that if they've got the data possible. already, they just convert that into, a, into JSON, and they sign it, and they send it back to you. But you're going to have to have um, extra endpoints for you to be able to send auth codes through, and it could be massive. It could be Let's say a you've week's worth. done that with one partner. So right. originally they were using LDAP or Shibboleth or something like that. And you, you came along and you said, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to use these JWT. Right? And you get through that exercise. Now you have a second partner. Can you just duplicate it for the second partner, the third partner? Or do you have to start a whole new dialogue and re-engineer everything all over again? Is it different for every? Putting my sales hat on. What you do is you get Auth0 to provide all the JSON web tokens to you, you use, and you have a SAML connection between Auth, because Auth0 can also be an identity client. It's an IDP and an IDC. So you can actually have your identity provider provide credentials to Auth0, and Auth0 will then use that as verification. You're logged in, generate the JSON web token, send it off to your application. I see. Done. I see. All right, I'll take so my sales hat, hat off one, again. One gateway, which is Auth0, and then they're just different identity suppliers. But there's still some part that has to be implemented on their side, right? Well, they're currently already an identity provider. Yes. So they just become an identity provider to zero instead of to you. Okay. So if they support SAML, I think we support Shibboleth as well. If they support uh, one of many authentication protocols, then you can probably plug it in as an extension to zero. That's a good answer. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I have to remind my boss to give me commission. Can I ask a, a business question? Is yes. it a viable business to become an open ID provider? Is it a viable business? Yes. Um, we recently got a fifth round of funding for 103 million US dollars and we're now valued at a billion dollars. So yes. I think it's viable. Auth, Auth zero. Um, there's also uh, Okta, uh -huh. um, AWS Cognito, uh -huh. uh, Azure has its own identity IDP. Uh, Ping, hey? HID. HID. So there's a number of other companies who also do the same thing. So there's at least six there, including Auth0. I reckon there's probably a bit of money in it. But in Asia, are you aware of anybody? Auth0. Auth0. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and HID. <laughs> but mostly Auth0. <laughs> The methodology of mm -hmm. OpenID Connect O02 are actually, well, that's an open standard right. you know, that's going to make it. That's why you have different IDP providers, which, yes. which may also, you know, um, I guess, you know, uh, O02, uh, uh, Amazons, and, and different kinds of uh, providers to kind of like agree on you know, the, the framework of how you can communicate and identify. This, but <coughs> the key business there is actually on the identity piece, you know, what you pass along. Yeah. Right, to you know the application, and again, we're trying as as an industry, we're, we're trying to move everybody uh, beyond username and passwords. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we can totally avoid it <laughs> at, at this point, but at least you know definitely uh, uh, try to add to it to make it much more uh, the application more secure. So I threatened to show you. I mean, I promised to show you what the uh, Auth0 dashboard looks like. Looks like I don't have internet access. Oh, yeah. So I, I can't refresh the page, but I can show you the menu items. So out of the box, um, when you write your own username password login, you've got username password login. And you're going to have to do your own um, password reminders and resets and all of those things. If you want to add multi-factor authentication, you're going to be spending more time on that as well. Uh, so by going to an identity as a, as a service type provider, you can get a whole lot of things out of the box almost for free straight away. <coughs> so in here I've got, I can't show you, a list of all the applications within my, so this is called a tenancy, a tenancy in the uh, identity provider world or in the, in the so software as a service type world means that while Auth0 has a lot of clients, I'm one and I'm, I'm individual. So all of my users are mine. It's not shared across. When you do login with Google or login with Facebook, for example, there's 
one big database of all the users. With Auth0, when you have your own tenancy, you control your own users. It doesn't <coughs> bleed across to other clients. Um, so I can set up a whole lot of applications and APIs. I can integrate with um, single sign-on options, uh, things like uh, Active Directory or even um, Azure Online. So if you, you can configure it so that if, you t if, you, if your company uses um, Office 365 and you start typing your email address in to log into a system, it'll detect the domain part, and if that domain matches a certain list, then it'll automatically redirect you off to log in via your Microsoft 365 account and then come back so you don't have to have a, a password within uh, Auth0 either. Um, you can connect to databases. These are databases that we host or databases that you host. So you can actually use a third-party database outside of Auth0 for <coughs> all of your credentials. We've got social, which I can't click on. Um, I might just get a quick Wi-Fi going just to show you. Does anybody know who HL Guest is? Can I use that access point or shall I start my own? I don't want to steal anybody's internet access. There we go. So if I refresh this now. <coughs> Why don't you refresh? Seems to have frozen. Bloody demos. Yeah, but the ma the mass point wasn't even changing. Like the the chromium was crashed. Ah, uh, hang on. There we go. There. All right. Isn't this fun? Bet you never thought you'd come to a meetup and just spend a minute looking at a refreshing page. <laughs> So in here we've got a whole lot of different the lo logos are load a whole lot of different socials. So I can come in and just automatically enable uh, LinkedIn authentication, give it the credentials that I have for my LinkedIn Dev account. Um, we've recently added the new Apple authentication, so you can use your Touch Bar for authenticating or something. I think um, database you can link directly to enterprise, so you could. It's a bit slow, isn't it? So this is where you'd link into your Office 365 directly. We've got a number of passwordless options. So from here you can, if it loads. Enterprise has SAML too? Uh, okay. Doesn't want to load this one. Um, but in here you've got things like Authenticate via SMS. May or may not be as secure as you like. Um, but uh, Authier also has something called Guardian, which is an app that you can install on Android and iOS so that if you want to log in, it then gives, sends you a push notification and you say yes or no to, uh, to, to authorize. The advantage of that is we've even got an SDK. So if you've got your own mobile app already, you can build that into your own app. So if you're, um, I don't know, an energy provider, for example, uh, and you, you had an application that allows people to see their current power usage on their phone and then they log into your website and they type in their uh, username and password, you can then pop up something in your own app saying somebody's trying to log onto the website as you. Do you want to go ahead? You go yes and then it logs them in. Um, so you can do that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so here's the, there's the duo security that we were talking about before. Uh, uh, SMS, push via Guardian, that's the one you can bake into your own app. One-time passwords that allow you to use the, things like Google Authenticator. So plugging this in as your identity provider gives you a whole lot of ways of making your system more secure just by flicking a switch. I should take my sales hat off again now. <laughs> um, How social logins do you support? Lots. Five hundred and twenty. No, it's forty some. <laughs> forty something, I think. Uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, 
13 times 3, 30, 42, approximately, if my maths is good and my counting is good. But, but it's easy to just add your own. Yeah, so we've got a whole lot of extensions as well. So you can add third-party extensions that allow you to do your own thing. Um, one of the interesting ones is a uh, account merging. So say, for example, you've got a client who's logged in and they've said, my email address is benedekarai.com, my password is password. <laughs> First of all, Auth0 would allow you to have a password, a password. Um, so when you've finally chosen a password that Auth0 is actually happy for you to have, and you can define your own um, like stringency in that. Um, if I then log in via Twitter the second time, and Auth0 will get my email address from Twitter, and it'll notice the email address is the same, and it'll say to me, it looks like these two accounts are the same person, do you want to merge them? And then once I've merged those, whichever one I log in as, you know how we were talking about the subject before being the unique identifier for a user that never changes? Whichever one I use, the application will get the same subject back. Can you briefly talk about the security aspect as well? I'm especially interested in the fraud part, uh, for fraud detection. I'm not, sure I, I'm not sure about briefly, and I probably couldn't talk um, to the full extent on what the options are. There are ways that you can, so we, we do support things like detecting uh, impossible travel. So if somebody logs in from um, uh, Singapore, and then three seconds later, somebody's trying to log in using the same account from London, they, you can detect that and you can block that. Um, you can do things, rather than blocking it, you can escalate and you can have optional multi-factor authentication. So you can have username and password is fine, but then if somebody logs in three seconds later from another city on the other side of the world, then say, look, we're detecting some <coughs> abnormal activity, we're now going to send you an SMS as well just to verify that it's actually you. Um, so there's very, various ways that you can kind of escalate that security aspect of it. And uh, the fact that, uh, I'm just uh, thinking out loud. So Google sends us these notifications when you're trying to log in from an unidentified device. So at some point, I point of time, they have this uh, browser fingerprint or device fingerprint. So do you guys do that as well? The uh, fingerprint as so in... The fingerprints or, you know, you're not talking about fingerprint, you're talking about like the device. The device yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay. Um, one of the things, like, even if we don't, you can add that in using hooks, I'm pretty sure. So we have a, a powerful hooking mechanism. We've got pre-authentication, post-authentication hooking mechanism. You can write your own JavaScript. It's basically a callback. We run Node on the server, and you can run whatever JavaScript code you want. So you could have a, um, a, a post-login, uh, post-authentication hook that will grab information out of the, the context, which I'm not sure if it would contain the fingerprint, to be honest, of the device. Um, but you could do things at that point that then I don't know, go off to a third party for extra verification or um, augment the, the JSON response. Okay. So How there's about bot detection. Like bot login, detection. Yeah, at login page itself. Because so, yeah, I'm not sure. Like at least forty percent of traffic which is bot most of the times. Sure. So do we have something about that as well? I can find out for you. I don't know off the top of my head. I wouldn't want to give you a wrong answer. For example, from the same IP, if uh, a bot is trying to log in at multiple attempts. But that's the thing, how do I detect the bot? So, uh, you don't need to detect them because uh, <coughs> we are using Auxio here. What happens is, uh, if there are more than 10 attempts, 10 failed attempts from one system, it blocks right there. If there are too many attempts, maybe successful for different accounts, then also you get blocked. So, based on IP? Not just based on the IP, it's based on the user ID. So one problem I have with IP is the napping thing, because it usually blocks a lot of authentic customers as well and detects them as bot, and we end up losing conversions based on that. So I do not really trust the IP part. It is solely based on that. Well, e-commerce will never say, no, I will log in. <laughs> Well, unless there are any more questions, um, I'm happy to socialize more and ask questions when I'm not mic'd up um, as well. But thank you all for your time. Um, and don't forget to join us for drinks afterwards. Thanks.